One of Money Week's favourite investments is the Exchange Traded Fund, or ETF. So in this video, I'll do a beginner's guide to what exchange traded funds are, why we like them, and in fairness, why they're not perfect in every situation. They do have one or two drawbacks, and it would only be fair of me to point out what they are. OK, so what is an exchange traded fund or an ETF? In short, it's a security, normally a share, that simply tracks an index, a basket of stocks, or something like a commodity, say gold. So what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is this. If you want exposure to, say, the S&P 500 index or the FTSE 100, what better way to get it, potentially, than to simply buy one share through your broker listed at the London Stock Exchange, so it's nice and easy to get hold of, it's got similar charges attached to buying a normal share in a standard company, and that gives you exposure to an entire index, all right, or something that might be quite difficult for you to buy and sell in the commodities market. Okay? And that's the point of exchange traded funds, in a nutshell. These are listed shares, typically, that give you exposure directly to something else, and that something else is typically an index, a basket of, say, shares or a commodity. All right. So, how do they work? Well, basically, I could uh, telephone my broker and say I want to buy an exchange-traded fund. Okay, and I need to pick one. They all have names. Now, the earliest ones had kind of snazzy names. So, a spider was a fund that tracked the S&P 500. A diamond was a fund that tracked the Dow Jones 30. All right. That's financial markets wizards being a little bit exciting about the way they name products. But these days, there are loads of ETFs that track all kinds of indices. So I need to be sure about what I'm asking for. So if I want something that tracks the S&P 500, um, I might indeed ask for the SPIDER, which is named after the three-letter code that's used to denominate it and separate it from other shares. All right. Now, um, my choice is, do I want a sterling listed exchange traded funds? I want to buy a sterling share. All right, I could buy a US one if I'm a US investor. In other words, exchange-traded funds are available on all the major exchanges in the relevant currencies. So as a UK investor, I might decide to pick up a share that tracks one of the major indices. Okay, And then what do I do? What happens next? Well, the idea is that if the underlying index moves up by 1%, then the share moves up by 1%. But here's the beauty. I could be buying a very small amount of the share. I mean, the index could be something big, Okay, that represents loads and loads of companies, but I can just buy you know one share, say for you know if I'm a US investor, one dollar, all right. And if the index goes up one percent, that share price rises one percent. The index falls one percent, the share price falls one percent. Or if in theory the gold price goes up one percent, the share goes up one percent, down one, down one. That's the theory, all right. And what's the point of that? Remember, it's that I don't have to get involved in the underlying asset. I can just buy this share and use that as a proxy for the asset itself. And buying shares is straightforward. Okay, everyone knows how to buy shares once they've got a bit of experience. Okay, so I'm going to expect to incur similar sorts of costs to buying, say, a, a Man United share. All right, so I'm going to potentially pay uh, the bid offer spread. All right, a little bit of commission to my broker. Do see my video on how to buy shares if you're not sure about that. But one benefit of exchange traded funds is you don't pay stamp duty, so you don't pay that half a percent up front that you pay on most other shares. All right, And um, there I have it. So I've got a share in my portfolio that simply mirrors the performance of the index that I've chosen. All right, So advantages, it's a simple product, up 1%, down 1%, all right, mirrored in the performance of the share, and it's relatively cheap. All right, Charges on exchange traded funds, Unlike, say, an alternative, the unit trust, which is something your broker might push at you because the commissions tend to be a bit higher, charges for exchange-traded funds, annual management fees tend to be quite low. Most have an annual management fee or a total expense ratio of less than 1%, and lots actually do much better than that and have an expense ratio of less than half a percent. All right, So that's pretty damn competitive. I mean, at half a percent, that could be you know, a third of the price of investing in something like a unit trust, for example. Okay, so you've got something that's simple, that's cheap. You can buy in any denomination. I mean, the minimum's one share, so you could buy one share or 10 shares or 100 shares. You've got flexibility there, and it's liquid. Unlike, say, buying a unit trust, which is another type of fund that can track things, okay, you can buy inside exchange traded funds any time of day while the market's open. 
right? You don't have to wait for a valuation point, as they call it, with unit trusts, which might only be twice a day or something. You can just trade them like a normal short share any time of day, all right? So lots and lots of advantages. Now, it would be misleading of me to say that it's all one-way traffic and that what you should do is ditch everything else in your portfolio and buy exchange-traded funds, okay? However, exchange-traded funds are brilliant, particularly in well-known developed markets, all right? Because basically, all you're going to get from an exchange-traded fund is tracking or following the underlying index or commodity, all right? So immediately, critics would say, well, you're not going to beat the market one of these things, are you? All right, if the market on average goes up 1%, the share will go up 1%, it won't go up 10%, okay? So if you want to beat the market, these things are not so good, are they? And that's true, but they do offer a very cheap, easy way of tracking a market, okay? So the reason they're cheap is you're taking away the fund manager. These are so-called passive instruments, and all that means in technical terms is there's typically a computer program, okay, monitoring the underlying holding, okay, whether that be shares in an index or a commodity like gold, there's not a fund manager sitting there taking investment decisions as your cash flows in and out of the exchange traded fund. All right? So that's what keeps the costs low. Now on the flip side, all right, these are passive, they track. All right? So you'll meet the performance of an index, but you won't beat it. Okay? In theory, if you want to beat the market, fund managers would say you need to pay them to do exactly that. But since so few of them actually do ever beat the market, we'd say, given a choice, we'd take the low-cost tracking exchange traded fund instead, okay? So, problems, all right? If you want to beat the market, ETS won't do it. Um, and do they perfectly track the underlying asset? Is it a bit of a simplification to say that if the uh, underlying index goes up 1%, the ETF goes up 1%? Yes, it is, uh, all right? And that's for a couple of reasons, potentially. One is tracking error. Just be a little bit careful, okay? The fund manager, um, uh, the exchange traded fund manager that is issues the ETF, okay, so you can buy the share on one side if you like, and then in theory is buying shares that exactly replicate an index such as S&P 500, right? But the exchange traded fund may not hold all of the shares in the index, it may just hold most of them, and that means that the performance of the ETF won't exactly replicate the performance of the underlying index. It might vary a little, that's called tracking error, and that's a fact of life. Some ETFs, the solution, is to look under the bonnet, get the fund sheet, and find out what's in there. Okay, you can do that. Um, so there's one problem. The next one is that some of the more sophisticated ETFs <coughs> in the commodities market, for example, don't actually physically hold the underlying asset. Okay, the fund may not physically own gold, for example. It may create an artificial position like holding gold using derivatives. And if that's the case, there's another source potentially of what I'd call tracking error. You won't necessarily see the sort of 1% uplift in the gold price mirrored by the 1% uplift in the ETF. Another issue is currency, okay? Be careful if the underlying asset is denominated in a currency which is not the one you're buying the ETF in on your local exchange, you'll get a foreign currency movement, okay, between the ETF and the share you're buying, all right? Obviously, if you line up, the currency of the underlying asset and the currency of the ETF, that shouldn't be so much of a problem, okay? So all those things can be sources of what are called tracking error. Now, next point, is it true to say that all ETFs are cheap? Mostly they are, and it's the simple ones you want, okay? So if you're just tracking large cap US stocks, why pay a fund manager? There's plenty of research that suggests they just don't do very well. All right, because all the information about those companies is well known. All investors can get hold of it. So how do they beat the market? They tend not to. So there, there's a great case for picking up a nice, simple, what I call plain vanilla exchange traded fund, because you'll probably get better performance, all right, or certainly no worse, for less money in terms of cost, okay? Um, but those plain vanilla ETFs are being joined in the market by sexier ones that are more expensive and try and draw your money in. Now, in this video, I'm not going to go through all the different types of ETF, but suffice it to say, the following words spell danger to me in the ETF market, or spell cost, and spell complication. Um, we don't like cost, and we don't like complication at Money Week. Inverse ETFs. Okay, as the market rises, they go down, and vice versa. Sounds a bit fruity, can be, and can also be expensive. All right, not the novice, it's that one. Geared ETFs, all right? Those are the ones where the market goes up 1%, the ETF in theory goes up 2% or 3%, all right? And vice versa, you can have an inverse geared, 
right now it's sounding pretty hairy, and be careful, because the performance of those things can be pretty damn difficult to predict. And you'll probably be paying extra money for the privilege of having this slightly sexier sounding ETF. Uh, and finally, the sort of strategy ETFs, you know, the, the active fund management industry is trying to fight back and say, well, we want to make money out of ETFs there. They're too cheap, there must be a way. So they're offering, you know, exchange traded fund that mirrors the strategy of a great investing guru. Mm, jury's out on whether that's a good idea or not. Fundamentally, the point of an ETF is to give you cheap, easy, straightforward access to a basic index or a basic asset. Okay, so steer clear of complication and steer clear of cost in this market. Right? So, in summary, exchange traded funds, an easy way for an investor to get access to something like an index or a commodity or a basket of shares, for example, without having to go to the hassle and expense of buying positions in every single component. All right? They're listed on major exchanges. They can be bought through a broker like a normal share. They can be traded pretty much any time of day and you'll incur similar costs to trading uh, a plain share other than that stamp duty tax that I mentioned in the UK. All right? So when would we use them? In summary, basically we would use them where there's no clear case for involving active fund management. And that tends to be in the well-known developed markets where frankly, as a fund manager, it's pretty difficult to get an edge.